Well, good morning. I want to start with an advert. This wasn't intended. I had it all nicely set up a week ago, and then God put a bit in at the front of this message, which messes all my timings up, but never mind. Um, And this is the advert. In this church, November the 7th, no, November the 9th, on Thursday, November 9th at 7.30, Janine, a friend of ours, Janine Salatos from Metro World Child, the director of the Kenya operation uh, in Metro. Now, Metro is the largest Sunday school on the the planet, um, and Janine runs the Kenya side of that. Now, I mentioned Metro, Janine and her boss, if you like, Pastor Bill, Pastor Bill Wilson, um, a couple of months ago, when I spoke here about crossing the line, I talked about the line that Christians draw sometimes that defines who they are and how far they're prepared to go. And for some people, it only means I go to church, I, I pray, I read the Bible every now and then, and so on. And that's my line. That's as far as I go. And I was talking then about pushing that line further back and doing more and, and, and seeing what God had placed in us to to further the kingdom in a bigger way. But people like Janine and Bill are people who don't seem to have any lines. They just cross them. They just do what it takes. And I've spoken about Bill a number of times because Bill is a bit of my, he is, is a hero of mine. And I spoke about him when I, I did a, uh, was it a baptism in the summer, about the heart of Jesus, because Bill has the heart of Jesus. And the heart of Jesus takes you into into rough places, into dangerous places. And I said at the time that one of the things that Bill had been called to do is to go to Syria. And I thought, well, that's not the sort of place that I would want to go. But Bill was called to Syria, and most pe- some people will know this, because of what's been going around on Facebook. But a couple of a month or so ago, Bill went to Syria to work with the, uh, with the charity to set up some stuff for kids, feeding programs and stuff like that. Um, and they shot him. They shot him in the back. Probably an ISIS sniper with a high-velocity rifle. Now, because he was wearing a bulletproof vest, it didn't kill him. But it broke a few ribs, punctured a lung, knocked him over where he fractured his skull. But Bill, being Bill, picks himself up, gets himself flown to London because he knew that he was at the start of a tour of the UK, raising awareness of what was going on in, uh, in Metro with the kids. And within a week of being shot in the back with a high-velocity rifle, he's out there preaching. Now, he carries on with the tour. He's missed one or two dates, and he's still coughing up blood. Um, But at the moment, he's over in Ireland, Northern Ireland, preaching at this time, probably at this moment, and also preaching again this evening. And then he's off on a European tour. See, people like Bill don't have lions. Neither does Janine. And Janine is cut from the same cloth. Janine sold up everything about three years ago to go to Kenya and set up the the metro side of it in uh, a place called Nakuru. And with a team of 15, which is about a quarter of what's in this room here, these 15 people in her team hit 85 schools every week. And they preach the gospel to more than 91,000 children, in addition to the feeding programs that they do. I mean, it's extraordinary. And on that Thursday that's up there on the screen, Janine will be here speaking. And the reason that God has put this in at the start of this message is very simple. I understood. I had it all sorted in my own strength. I, I, had, I had the message kind of geared, all timed and so on. And then God puts this in at the start. Because sometimes we deal with the notices. And this is what the church is doing. And then we come to the message, which is what God is saying. And God said, no, put them together. This is what I am saying as part of the message. That the church needs to be here. People need to be here. When I heard that Bill had gone down, and some ISIS sniper presumably thinks, well, that's taken him out, well, you're mistaken, because Bill gets back up and carries on preaching. Nothing stops him. And I thought when I heard that Bill had been shot, I thought Janine is not going to come here, and there's going to be a single person missing that meeting on the grounds that they didn't know about it. 
that God isn't called. What I'm asking is that people come and they bring people. Youth bring youth. Africa bring Africa. Because these people doing stuff that I wouldn't dare to do deserve support. This is not about whether I come to a meeting and get something out of it. That's irrelevant. I'm kind of reckoning that if I listen to somebody who with 15 people is reading 91,000 kids every week, I'm probably going to get something out of it. But it doesn't matter. Bill will tell you, not everybody is called to do what I do, he says. I'm just the idiot who goes out there, gets into fights and gets shot. Not everybody is called to do that. But I could not do this without people behind me, without people praying for me, supporting us financially and encouraging us. And I want this as a church to encourage someone like Janine. So I'm laying it on people's hearts to put that date in your diary, circle it and make it non-negotiable. People like Janine and people who do this sort of stuff deserve encouragement. And if I'm not ever going to go to Syria, believe me, I don't have it in me to do that sort of stuff. I can at least be in Blackburn on a kind of wet November night. I can do that. Now, God bolted that onto the start of a message that it kind of fits in a way. I haven't really thought about it, but it kind of fits. Because the message that God gave me was basically the most obvious message I've ever been given. And I knew that because he gave me the title before he gave me the actual message. And the title is this. A simple truth. Now, I like that because I'm a simple person. Believe me, I'm a simple person. I used to believe I was some kind of intellectual, but I'm not. I do not like complications. I do not like things that are difficult. I don't like jargon. For me, when I was a school teacher, teaching is about taking the things that are potentially complicated and making them simple. And it's the same with preaching. If you send people out of a message and they're scratching their heads thinking, oh, I didn't get much out of that, I didn't understand it, you've wasted your time and theirs. So keep it simple. Now we live in a world that complicates things, don't you reckon? We take the simple and we complicate it. We analyze it, we dissect it, we turn it into something that was never intended. One of the classics of that is cooking. Cookery programs, my word. You see some of these things, these master chef, these competitions, and you've got some guy wandering around, looking totally and utterly stressed, pressured, looking at the watch, rushing about, looking like he's having no fun at all. At the end of it, he finishes up draping some little piece of serrano ham over a little pyramid of quinoa, <laughs> infused with you know, pochini mushrooms and flavoured by a herb you can only get in the middle from the centre of the Amazon rainforest, not at little. Then they decorate it with foliage and drizzle some little bit of useless sauce around it to make it look like a meandering river. While the, while the presenter's hovering in the background going, oh, cooking doesn't get any tougher than this. It's cooking. It's not joining the SAS. <laughs> cooking. It's producing food. Not going through an assault course. And you're supposed to eat it, not hang it on the wall. It's taking the simple and make it complicated. You try saying that to the kids that Janine feeds out in Africa. Sorry, guys, I couldn't feed you because the local delicatessen was cleaning out the falafels. We take the simple and we, and we do the same in relationships, don't we? I mean, I thought, sorry for kids. I mean, you get some little four-year-old kid who's decided in his rash moment to cover his little sister with custard. Now, he doesn't get a clip or sent to his room. Oh, no, he gets the psychological inquisition. What were you feeling when you did that? What was going through your head? How do you think your little sister felt? How do you think mummy and daddy felt when they came in to find that little Emily Sky Child turned into a trifle? <laughs> Now off you go to the meditation step and sit on that for five minutes. 
I mean, come on, well, what's the kid supposed to do? Come back in five minutes and say, yeah, I've really thought about that. And I realise that I never fully appreciated the socio-economic implications of what I'd done. How poor little Emily Skyerchild's low self-esteem could be elevated and it might cause a irreparable damage in her future relationships with members of the opposite sex. No, <laughs> the kid is sitting there going, seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> But we complicate it. We take the simple and we make it complicated. See, the problem is, of course, that we do the same for our relationships with God. We apply it to Christian life. Most people who are Christians here today would probably say this, I think I want to lead a good, Christ, lead a good Christian life. Well, if that's what you want to do, be reassured there's a lot of help out there. I went on the internet because I came up here, and I, before I came and I tapped in, books on how to live a good Christian life. You know, 33 and a half million pages. Now, not all those are individual books, I'll grant you, but it shows there's a lot of information out there if you want to lead a good Christian life, isn't there? That will keep you going for a bit, a whole library full of information to read. Books like How to Be a Mindful Christian, The God-Centered Brain, Discipleship, The Key to Christian Living. You can read them all if you want, and there'll be some good stuff out there. On the other hand, you could cut through it by turning to John 14, verse 15, and see what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commands. It's not rocket science, is it? If you think that having a relationship with Jesus is important, that getting to understand him and being in love with Jesus is important to your Christian life, great. If you love him, do what he says then. Seems fairly simple. Now, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that reading books and studying is irrelevant. Of course I'm not. I'm not saying just keep everything skating over the surface. I'm not suggesting you go back and serve up your, your Sunday lunch with a trowel. You know, presentation is important, and you talk to kids, of course it is, and that we study. What I'm saying is that the balance has to be right, because if studying how to live a good Christian life gets in the way of actually living, then something's gone wrong. We need to study, this is not having a go, honest Jamie, about Bible study and depth. We need that. But we also need to understand the simple truth. So that on the screen there is a simple truth. You can't misunderstand it. You can't negotiate it. If you love Jesus, you will do what he says. That will be your goal. All you now need to do is to study what he's actually telling you to do. It's not rocket science. But we do need to understand that there is a difference between God's simple truth and man's clever one-liners. The Bible is full of simple truths. Facebook is full of clever one-liners. Lots of it Christian. It's there all the time. People putting in little bits of wisdom. And some of it is helpful. But some of the stuff isn't. Some of the stuff clouds the issue a bit. I'll give you an example. When I first became a Christian, early years, and somebody was talking about living a Christian life, they quoted from St. Francis, and they quoted this. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Now, St. Francis, I think it's 13th century, isn't it? Set up the Franciscans and so on. The guy with the brown abbot used to talk to animals, I think. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And I thought, isn't that clever? Isn't it? Preach the gospel at all times. You only have to use words when because the gospel will show itself in the way that you live. And that sounded really good. But of course, it's not God's simple truth. In fact, it obscures a truth. There's something not quite right with it. Apart from the fact, by the way, that St. Francis never said it. You can buy it as a Christian poster and put it on your wall, but St. Francis never said it. There's nothing to suggest he said it, nothing in his right to suggest he said anything even vaguely like it. So bearing that in mind, as a statement, it sounds really good, but it's not quite it, is it? 
See, if you live a Christian life, a good moral life, and the hope that somebody's going to come to you and say, what's different about you? And you can say, it's because I'm a Christian. That's great. It's basically the way that Liz became a Christian, seeing it in something else, in somebody else. But if you go to a lot of people who are leading good lives, moral lives, what are they going to say to you? They might say, it's because I'm a Muslim. I'm a Mormon. They might say, I'm a nice person save the planet, and I go around hugging trees and saving the whale. That's why I'm a good person. They're not all going to say I'm a Christian. So the fact you live a nice moral life, that's not enough. It is not enough because people will see you and they may not ask you. There's something more to it. What it does, in fact, is obscure a simple truth that Paul wrote about in Romans, in Romans chapter 10. And we've got a line from it up in front of us there. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10 verse 9. There's a simple truth. If anybody's not a Christian here today, you don't earn it, you don't buy it, you don't study for it. If you believe that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a simple truth. Now we have to build on that. But Paul goes on to say this, a couple of verses later. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Same thing, more or less. But then, goes on to add this. How then can they call on the one they have not? believed in and how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them and how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news do you get it it's all very well living a nice moral life and waiting for people to come up and ask you but that's not the simple truth of God the simple truth of God is that you need to go out and tell people if you're not telling people you're missing it How can people hear about Jesus unless somebody tells them? And how can somebody tell them if they don't go? That's one of the reasons why we need to support people like Janine. 91,000 kids every week are hearing the gospel. More than I'll ever reach in a lifetime as a school teacher. And I need to bear that in mind. I need to support people who do it. The gospel is to be spoken out. We need to go and tell people. Of course we need to live a nice moral life because if we love Jesus, we'll do what he says. But one of the things that he's saying very clearly is go out and tell people. Go out and tell people. Don't leave it to others. See, that is a simple truth. That is a simple truth. And just to show that I'm not against Bible study. I want to do a very short little piece of Bible study now by illustrating that point from the story of the siege of Samaria. Now you find the siege of Samaria, I'll go to a little scripture in a a moment, in 2 Kings chapter 7. Now here's the position with the siege of Samaria and whether you're a Christian or not here this morning you'll get this, I'm sure. The city of Samaria was under siege from the Syrians, the Arameans. And because they had the city blockaded, there was fear, people were dying, there was famine, there was hardship. And that's the kind of situation we recognize in our world today, don't we? There's never been a time in my recollection where people have lived under so much fear. You've got two world leaders out there who are crazy. And they're not just pointing the finger, calling each other mad, they're actually waving nuclear weapons at each other. And if that wasn't bad enough, we don't seem to be safe on a beach in Tunisia, on a seafront in France, on a tube train in London, at a pop concert in Manchester, or a country and western festival in Las Vegas, without somebody trying to take us out, somebody with an agenda. The world has never been so fearful. And in addition to that, We've got this increasing gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. Because in Samaria, it was the same. People who had food could charge a fortune for it. So there was this great gap between the rich and poor. 
And it's the thing, the situation that the world has to do. Fear, anxiety, a gap between rich and poor, inequality, hardship. Just like Samaria. And just like the people in Samaria, they were looking to a person to sort it out. They were going to the king and saying, come on, do something. And we do the same, don't we? I think it's why Donald Trump got elected. Because he simply could stand there and say, I will make our country great again. That's enough. That's all we want to hear. That's all the people want to hear. Make us feel better about the future because we're frightened. Doesn't matter about the details. Don't tell us the details, Donald, because we'll get the drift that you can't actually do it. But just tell us you can sort it out. That's all I want. I will make our country great again. It's probably why we left, why Brexit came about, wasn't it? People just standing there and saying, if we leave Europe, we will get our country back. Nobody knows what it looks like. We just do it because we desperately want to change. And now they're doing the same with poor old Jeremy, aren't they? I'm not political about this, but Jeremy Corbyn, poor guy, is now supposed to be going to step in and make this gap between the rich and the poor narrow. He can sort it out. Jeremy can sort it out. Well, no, he won't. He won't because he can't, because he's the wrong JC. It's as simple as that. He's the wrong JC. They can tinker about with at the edges and make a good stab at it, but you can't sort it out. And they knew that in Samaria as well, because in the middle of Samaria was one guy who was speaking God's word, and that was the prophet Elisha. Now, Elisha said, it's okay, guys, God's going to sort it out in 24 hours. So that's it. All you've got to do is wait. And it's actually the same for us. We don't have to do anything, by the way. We just wait. God will sort it out. Jesus is coming back. The real JC is coming back. He will sort it out. You can't do anything about it. You can't stop it. We don't have a timetable like they had in Samaria, 24 hours, but then it says that a day is like a thousand years to God. And I reckon that just about covers the timetable, don't you? Somewhere between tomorrow and a thousand years, God is going to sort it out. Jesus is coming back. Nothing you can do about it, or I can do about it, or anybody can do about it. So we've just got to hang on and wait, haven't we? Now, if that was it, that's the story of the siege of Samaria. It's okay, guys, just wait. God will sort it out. Then I can put my hands up and say, see, I told you so. But of course, that isn't the story of the siege of Samaria. Into the middle of the story, into the middle of that narrative, God introduces, guess what? People. And these people are a picture of you and me. It's where we fit in. So let's look at those. 2 Kings, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Here they are. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. Lots of dies in there, aren't there? Here are four guys and they are you and me. Before we had any idea of Jesus. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, they're you. They realize something. They've got a problem. They have worries, and they're living in a world that has its own problems. And if they do nothing about it, guess what? They're going to die. If we stay here, we will die. No point in looking to the world to sort it out. If we go into the city, we're going to die there as well. There is nothing we can do if we stop here. We have to do something, and we have to do something radical. Because there's no other option. If you stay where you are, die. So what did they decide to do? Well, effectively, take a step of faith. We have no option. We take a step of faith. We head to the camp of the Arameans, and if we die there, if that doesn't work, no difference. But there's a chance, and it's the same with everybody, isn't it, when we tell them? If you stay where you are, caught in your sin, separated from God, guess what? You're going to die. You have no hope. But if you take a step of faith, there's hope, at least. 
Now, we don't go down to the camp of the Arameans. We go to Jesus. We go to the cross. But there's a step of faith. That's what it's about. And these guys took a step of faith. They couldn't work it out. They didn't know what was there. But they went. And what did they find when they got there? Verses 5 to 7. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up, fled in the dusk, and abandoned their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. They discover the camp's empty. They've all gone. God has sorted it out. They don't understand it. They can't explain it any more than you and I could explain it. Who is, who are Christians, can explain it when we took that step of faith. We can't explain it. It's just there. We discover that we took a step of faith and it's paid off. The threat is gone. So what do they do when they discover that? Well, it's what we did. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Well, they do exactly what we would do, wouldn't we? We're hungry. We eat. We've got nothing in our lives. We take the treasure. We look after. We got excited. Can you remember that if you're a Christian? Can you really remember that? When you discovered that you were going to die, you took a step of faith, you came forward at a meeting, something happened, and you discovered that, wow, you were in touch with something extraordinary. You discovered that church wasn't a dull place with stained glass windows. You discovered it was alive, and that people were celebrating. You discovered that worship wasn't old-fashioned hymns that you didn't understand, sung in a monotone, like on songs of praise used to be. You discover that people celebrated, hands in the air, they got excited. Can you remember that? Can you remember connecting with a whole range of people who seemed to be alive? You discovered that missing piece in your life that you've been searching for. Somehow the piece of jigsaw, the last piece of the jigsaw went in. Can you remember when the Bible became alive? You looked at the Bible and it wasn't a dusty book full of these and thous, but it was a love letter with your name on it. Of course you do. You, you celebrate the whole thing. It's exciting. It's what you were looking for. You thought you were going to die. You took a step of faith and wow, it's paid off big time. And that's what they do. They eat all they need. They store up treasure. We are set up for life. We're okay. And then the penny drops, doesn't it? Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, judgment will overtake us. Let us go at once and report this to the royal palace. See, there's something. And the penny dropped. After they'd done all the excitement bit and looking after it all and looking after themselves and storing up treasure and getting a real buzz from it or they realize well wait a minute what we're doing is not right we are in possession of a piece of information here and just over the hill there there's a city that isn't aware of that and because they're not aware of it they are living behind walls hemmed in by their fear and their insecurity and their famine and their injustices they're frightened, and we know something that will set them free. We cannot keep this to ourselves. We can't. See, what were they actually in possession of? What piece of information were they in possession of? See, because in a sense, they didn't actually need to do anything. The people in Samaria would have found out the next day anyway. They weren't going to sit behind in their city for months. They would have discovered it had gone quiet out there. They would have sent somebody out to investigate. The next day, they will have discovered that God had sorted it out. So what was the little piece of information that these guys were in possession of? Not that God will sort it out, but he already has. 
See, if the world waits, this crazy world in which we live waits long enough, it's okay, it will sort it out because Jesus is coming back. But when Jesus comes back, it's too late for some people. We're in possession of the fact that Jesus has already been, God has already sorted it out 2,000 years ago on the cross, and it's available, this freedom is available to everybody here and now. We have to tell them. We cannot keep this to ourselves, because while we're keeping it to ourselves, people are dying. While we're keeping it to ourselves, people are living in fear, in inequality. They think there's no hope. We have to tell them. And they recognize this. And if we don't tell them, punishment will overtake us. Punishment will overtake us. If we are caught in our silence at sunrise, we're in trouble. We've got some answering to do. And it's the same for us, isn't it? If the church is caught in its silence at sunrise, we're in trouble. Or in our case, not when the sun comes up, but when the sun, S-O-N, returns we're in trouble. Because what are we going to say to him? Huh? When Jesus returns and looks us in the face and says, why did you not tell anybody? What are we going to say? What punishment will overtake us? Well, it won't be that we are chucked into hell. Romans 10.9 tells us that. That's not the basis upon which our salvation lies, telling people. So I don't know what the punishment will be. Perhaps it's enough to look in Jesus' eyes and try to answer that question. Why did you keep silent? Why did you keep silent? Why did you not tell people? What are we going to say? Well, we could say, because I was frightened, because I'm shy. I haven't got it in me to do that. I was scared. Well, I don't think that's going to cut it somehow, do you? Jesus might well say, did you not read 2 Timothy 1 verse 7? For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love and self-discipline. Did you not understand that? Was that not a simple truth, simple enough for you? I did not give you a spirit of fear, I gave you a spirit of power. So that one won't wash. What else could we try? We could say, I didn't know enough. People tie me in knots when I try to tell them. They ask me questions I can't answer. Well, that's not going to wash, is it? If you don't know the answer to the question, find out. Steve Barnes told us that when he did that little course a few weeks ago on evangelism. If you tell people about Jesus, the gospel, they will come back to you and ask you questions like, well, look, if God is so wonderful and so loving, why is there all this suffering going on? They will ask you that. They ask us it in prison all the time. Why does that happen? Well, you can't just sit if somebody's going to ask you a question like that, scratch your head and go, I don't know. You prepare an answer. You wouldn't go to an interview knowing they were going to ask you a particular question and think, oh, I haven't actually considered the answer. So you prepare it, you study it, you go to people who do this sort of stuff and you say, can we sit down and have a little chat? How do we answer this question in a way that people will get? You prepare. And all the other questions they ask you. So that doesn't do it. That's where the studying comes in. The simple truth is, if you love Jesus, you do what he says. And what he's saying is go out and tell people. That's the simple truth. You can't escape that one. How we do it and how we prepare for it is another matter. Or we could say, well, they won't listen. I've tried telling people in my family, in my workplace, they don't listen. Well, these guys did that. These guys went to the palace and they reported it. And it says this, so they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there, not the sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. That's all it says. They went back and told them. They didn't give them a long lecture on it, they just told them their testimony. They told them what they'd seen and what they knew. And that's all that we do. 
That's why we go on so much. Prepare your testimony. When people say, what's God done for you? How do you become a Christian? Have an answer. Don't scratch your heads thinking about it. Prepare it. That's all they needed to do. Say what they knew. Now, did they believe them? Of course they didn't. They reported in the palace and they said, well, they must be, they must be spies. They must, have, they must be lying. It must be a trap. They didn't believe them. And they may not believe us either, but that's not the point. So what? It started a train of events. They told the people at the gate. They told the people in the palace. The king told somebody, we'll go out and check it. Somebody went out to check it, and then they come back and said, it's true. And they all left. They all discovered freedom. And that's all that we do, isn't it? It's not a matter of whether people believe you. They can throw it back in your face if you want. It's not important. It's up to God to make it take root. So tell them. And then leave it to God. Because you never know what chain of events will lead you from what you say to what people in the end choose to do. It's so simple. We don't have a reason we don't have a reason to remain silent. I don't want to labour this because this is a simple truth. I don't want to labour it. I don't want to repeat stuff. If it's going to be simple, let's keep it simple. And I'm going to wrap it up at this point. But the simple truth is this, folks. If you don't know Jesus you're in trouble. If you don't know Jesus and you do nothing, no easy way to say it, you're going to die. And it's time to take a step of faith. It's the only thing you can do. Check it out. We have a responsibility to tell people the gospel. We're not responsible for how people respond to it. So we can tell people, if you respond to this, that's down to you and God. It's not down to me. My responsibility is to tell people. And we're telling you. The church's responsibility is to go out and do the right thing. Live a life that honours Jesus. And part of the thing that will honour Jesus is to tell people. We're not going to get a church to 300 by praying 300 people to walk through the door supernaturally. You tell people. And it's not your responsibility how they receive that. And that's it. So can we bow our heads, please? And let's just uh, commit this to the Lord. We just thank you, Father, for your word. Your word, your word says, Lord, that it will not go out and return void and empty. So I just pray now, Father, that people's hearts are touched and that something takes root. Lord, and I am not responsible for what that actually looks like. We pray for the church, Father, the people who are Christians here, Lord, that they will understand that we have a responsibility to live our lives in the way that, that Jesus told us to live. And then part of that is to tell people. So let that word settle on people. I pray, Father, that you will bless them that everybody listening here this morning will be blessed, will take something with them, and will not leave this place unchanged. And if as part of that, of course, it means you've never taken that step of faith, of course, that's what you do. It doesn't look like anything, by the way, folks. Putting your hand up, coming to the front of a meeting, it might do. But it would be good if you take that step for the first time, that you tell somebody. You tell me. You tell Jane. You tell somebody. Why? Because it says, if you confess Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You speak it out. And that would be good. And I'm going to leave that with you and hand over to Jamie. God bless you, folks. Thank you.